Hey there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Body Shop Business, the podcast. And today I have a very special guest with me, Ray Roth, who's a director with Stout. And we're going to talk about the employee retention credit. But Ray, first of all, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Um, yeah, I want you to tell me a little bit about your career path and how, how you got to where you are today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I am a CPA. I'm also a certified fraud examiner. Um, known as a forensic accountant in the industry. And it's a very niche type of CPA. I've spent my nearly 20 year career quantifying damages in complex litigation, uh, conducting fraud investigations, um, and working with compliance monitorships. Uh, so what that means is I've done impact analyses uh, for different purposes um, under uh, sometimes very strict uh, rules. Um, and that's transitioned very well for me with ERCs and been a natural evolution um, because that's my role in the ERC process is I'm identifying and quantifying the effect that government COVID orders had on your business. So let's talk about the ERC or the employee retention credit. In a nutshell, what is it? So it's a piece of government COVID stimulus. It's one of the last pieces, maybe the last piece um, that businesses can still claim. And it offers a payroll tax credit up to $26,000 per employee. Um, so it's, it's quite lucrative um, if you can meet certain eligibility requirements. Um, and there's, there's a few things. Um, you need to you need to check the box on um, some are size limits and common ownership but what businesses uh, should first think about um, or understand is there's 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 two tests that they're going to need to meet uh, to show their eligibility and one's pretty straightforward it's a it's a revenue test if you can meet um, certain thresholds that the irs has determined um, it's 50 percent for 2020 and uh, 20% for 2021 using 2019 as a baseline, uh, that's a basis for eligibility that your revenue has declined uh, by those percentages. And it's, it's a quarter by quarter test, but um, pretty simple and, and straightforward. Um, the other test is what's known as a, a full or partial suspension. And so a full suspension is what you would probably think. It means your business was shut down, not allowed to operate because of a specific COVID order. But a partial suspension is defined is you made modifications to your business to comply with government COVID orders. Um, and that could also include an inability to obtain critical goods and materials um, to operate within your normal course. Interesting. So tell me, can a collision shop qualify for the ERC? Uh, absolutely. We've worked with several automotive repair and, and specifically collision shops, uh, you know, definitely north of 50, probably approaching uh, 100 at this point. Um, and we're, f we're finding very, very common impacts. Uh, you know, each, each shop has sometimes their own niche and their own and their own specialties. Um, but the 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 key to this um, is really how did government COVID orders impact your business? Uh, for the most part, I'm not seeing a lot of collision shops qualify on the revenue piece of this um, for, for a few reasons, but mainly demand did remain pretty strong throughout the pandemic. Um, inflationary pressure had started to set in, and then there's been a lot of consolidation and growth in, in the industry, um, so you're not tripping um, those revenue thresholds. So even if you are qualifying under the revenue test, you're generally only getting one or two quarters. Most shop owners are, are telling me they were severely impacted uh, by the government COVID orders. And so that starts with how they were interacting with their customers, um, picking up and dropping off vehicles, um, lost efficiencies on the shop floor, because uh, you're trying to spread people out. You don't have uh, the relationship, especially with junior techs and senior techs. You know, in the pre-COVID days, 
the tech would a junior tech could go over to a senior tech and say, hey, I'm having a problem with this. Could you help me? They work side by side. There's the demonstration. Uh, now they're trying to shout, you know, across the shop floor. They're, they're texting each other. Um, you can't share tools. Um, there's additional cleaning and sanitization. Um, then move on to your interaction with insurers. Um, claim adjusters um, generally did not come on site anymore. Um, so that's more work for the shop owners and their employees to take pictures, uh, do additional paperwork. And then we also talked about the inability to obtain critical goods and materials. Um, if your supplier uh, was suspended, well, I mean, it's pretty obvious um, at this point that there was a part supply disruption within automotive. So that's been that's been a huge effect. Um, you know, but the key the key to that, um, you know, is tying it back to government COVID orders, uh, specific suppliers um, and identifying what the suspension was. Yeah. So so tell me, why, why do so many companies think they won't qualify for the ERC? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. You know, as I was uh, looking over, uh, you know, the facilities and all the equipment today, you know, really kind of a, a light bulb moment uh, went off. It's kind of an inverse relationship to the average vehicle owner like me that knows um, very little about cars and vehicle repair. When I go in to have my vehicle serviced and repair, I'm putting a lot of trust into the shop owners and, and, and the professionals that are taking care of my vehicle. When they're telling me everything that's wrong with my car and everything that needs to be done, it's very foreign to me. It's unknown. It goes, it goes over my head because uh, I just don't understand vehicles the way they do. Um, and I think that's partly when we start talking, when accountants and lawyers start talking tax credits to a shop owner, I think they have um, a very similar type of reaction of, uh, I don't know what you're talking about and what you're telling me. Um, and so you're, you're really relying on uh, the advice that, that you're given. And with this program specifically, there's been, there's been a lot of rule changes, um, the last of which was uh, in the spring of 21. So we're mainly past that. But um, you know, over the last couple of years, it was hard to keep straight of what are the basis for qualification, what are the periods. Um, it used to be that if you claim PPP, you can you cannot claim ERC, um, and a lot of businesses had claimed PPP, so they thought they were prevented. Um, but then part of it too goes back to um, the revenue test and the partial suspension test, and so. The revenue test, not to oversimplify it, but it is more black and white. It's formula driven. Um, and so your traditional tax preparer and accountant that's preparing your financial statements, which is the trusted advisor uh, for a lot of these shop owners, are comfortable with that piece of it. But then when you get to the partial suspension piece of it, not only do you have to demonstrate the modifications that were made because of COVID orders, the IRS wants to see uh, a 10% or more impact to the business from complying with those orders. And a lot of traditional um, CPAs read that and they say, well, you're not even telling me 10% of what? It's not obvious to me how to calculate um, this. A lot of accountants um, are conservative by nature. Um, they don't want to, they would rather not steer their clients into an overly aggressive position and say, I don't see an easy path for qualification for you. But somebody like myself, um, who is a niche area within the CPA profession, when I quantify damages in complex litigation, nobody's telling me how to measure those damages. There's not a formula I'm applying. Instead, I'm understanding the business, what are the key metrics um, and drivers of success for that business, how are they measured, and then what are the causal elements that changed because the, of the alleged action of the defendant. And then I put that all together and I'm able to put a number on it. Um, very similar type process with my role in the ERC process, instead of it, the causal event being the alleged action of the defendant, 
it's the government COVID orders that, you know, as many of us know, um, probably all too well at this point, really turned a lot of businesses upside down. Mm -hmm. So Ray, tell me, how can collision shops qualify for this ERC? <clears throat> yeah, so it goes, it goes back to um, mainly demonstrating the significant drop in revenue or being able to demonstrate an impact uh, from the government COVID orders, which do include the supply chain disruptions. Um, and so those are, those are the tests. There's, there's other rules you know, that businesses do need to be aware of. Um, so there is a size limit um, on this. This is geared towards small businesses. And so it was originally a max of 100 full-time employees for 2020 that got expanded to 500 uh, full-time employees uh, for 2021. Um, so if you're over that, that's something to be aware of. But it's also common ownership um, in, in total employees. So if you own multiple businesses of two, if you let's say you have three businesses of 200 each full-time employees, you would size out of it because they look at it as a commonly controlled group um, an aggregate uh, total number of employees. On the partial suspension side of it though, the IRS also views that if, you, if one of your businesses has a partial suspension, then all of your businesses are deemed to have a partial suspension. So there's a, there's a downside of it is it could cause you to size out, but they're at least consistent with how they apply the rules that you could claim the credit uh, for all of your businesses. Um, if one of them qualify because they're considering it commonly controlled. Okay, and, and what if a shop uh, filed for this a while ago, but uh, they don't have the proper documentation right now, what can they do? So they, they should uh, treat this very, very seriously. As, as we said before, this is a very lucrative tax credit um, of up to 26,000 per employee. In my experience, I haven't seen anyone get the, the full amount of that for a variety of reasons. Generally between 15 and 20,000 um, is what I'm seeing in the, in the collision industry. So, you know, still, still very lucrative, but um, don't want anyone to latch on to uh, the wrong expectations there. But the, the common credit amount is generally several hundred thousand for, for smaller shops um, to well north of, of a million, um, you know, for um, shops of 50 or more uh, employees. The, the IRS uh, imposes penalties if they think that you've filed for this in, improperly. Um, and so if, if, they, if they determine that you have not um, filed in good faith, have a reasonable basis for filing, you could be subject to penalties between 25 and 75% of the credit amount. So if you're talking a credit of a half million dollars um, and even a 25% uh, penalty on that is, is substantial that you need to, to pay back on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, now that's a six figure fine that you're gonna need to come out, out of pocket for in addition to giving back what you've already received. Um, so I know I'm not answering your question yet, I'm getting there, but I'm just trying to um, you know, say that, that it's important um, because, because of the money that's at stake and the penalty that, that can be um, deemed is substantial. Um, so you, you want to be able to support all aspects of the credit. Um, and so that includes why you think you're eligible for it, whether it's the revenue test or the partial suspension. The revenue, like we said, is you know fairly easy. Um, there is a formula for partial suspension, um, and that's my piece of this. We we deliver generally between a twenty-five and thirty-page report, and what the IRS is most interested in, the language in their guidance, is each business's unique facts and circumstances. And so, you know, I talk generally of you know what's going on in the industry. You can't have a report of saying, well, this is generally what the issues were. Um, you need you know, an affirmative um, statement and basis that this is what was going on in the shop. Um, so qualitatively, what, 
what changed um, and how does that relate to the government orders. And then you need to be able to, to quantify that. Um, and for collision shops, um, the metric that I use um, mainly uh, to support the quantitative piece of it is cycle time. Um, measured in the average number of days to complete repair orders. Um, and I use 2019 as a baseline, and then I compare um, monthly um, 2020 and 21 um, to the common month in 19 to demonstrate um, an increase if it is present. Um, and I am seeing very consistently increases well north of the 10% threshold generally more in the 20% to 100%. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're losing all the efficient efficiencies, don't have parts, have labor absences, it's going to take you longer to repair cars. Um, and what, you know, what generally happened is, you know, volume um, went down um, to a certain degree, but then the time to repair vehicles went up substantially for all of the reasons we've we've talked about. Um, so you're going to want to see something like like that, where you have you have documentations that's that's going to show all the changes you made modifications, and then have a means to to measure that in our product. Um, so we we get into that specific. Um, we have we have a questionnaire that all of our clients uh, complete. It's about a hundred questions, um, and some of our clients take a, a hard uh, hard swallow when they hear you're going to have to go through a hundred question survey. Basically, what it is, but uh, we feel it needs to be thorough, uh, and we try to set it up where as you answer as yes no questions, and as you answer yes, we get into more detail, and if you say no, you move on. Um, but in order to demonstrate unique facts and circumstances, we feel we need to ask the questions and get all the information from our clients that we summarize. Um, then we also do an, an industry analysis of, hey, it's not just this shop. This was very common throughout the, the industry, um, but also just as important, you know, we talked about... Um, Part supply um, and supply chain disruptions as being key for this. Well, it's somewhat obvious at this point that there was a part supply disruption in automotive, um, but it's important to tie it back to government COVID orders. Um, and I'll give you an example of something that has some noise in it that may be unrelated to the orders. Um, there was a tire shortage um, at, over the same time of the pandemic. Well, there was a rubber disease in South America um, that drastically impacted supply. So not that COVID and the related orders didn't play into it, but there's other non-causal elements in there. Um, so that's something, you know, we, we, we kind of just take off the table in our analysis. If that's the, the main part that's unavailable, it's not the case generally, but just an example. But instead, um, within our background section, we look at what was going on in domestic manufacturing. Um, and even more than that, uh, you know, we got information on um, the, the, the percentage of your vehicle that includes domestic parts. Um, you know, as all car enthusiasts know, your vehicle is comprised of, you know, tens of thousands, 15 to 20,000 components and subcomponents. Um, well, for the Detroit Three, the you know the traditionally uh, domestic brands, you know as you'd expect, you know seventy to eighty percent plus of that vehicle contains parts that are manufactured within the U.S. But even a lot of foreign brands, especially Toyotas and Hondas, for example, have a very high percentage of uh, domestically made parts. Um, so we look at what was going on with domestic part manufacturing. Um, and even though auto was deemed essential everywhere, that means they didn't have to shut down, uh, but they still had to comply with social distancing and gathering and capacity limitations. Um, so that resulted in many of these suppliers needing to shut down for short periods of time um, to spread their assembly lines and assembly stations out. Um, and then, so that took time. 
uh, to do that. But then before they came back online, they needed to go through a PPAT process. And that means they needed to validate and update their quality controls um, on the line to make sure everything was fine tuned and working the way um, they want to specific specifications. Um, and so that takes time. And so you have a lost, uh, a lost period of output um, that you're suspended just from that alone. Well, once you come back online, they didn't come back at 100% capacity. They came back at some decreased percentage of capacity because first, well, you just spread things out and lost your manufacturing floor. Um, but then there was also severe labor issues um, that can be tied back to the orders. Um, in most places, you had to quarantine if not only you came down with symptoms, but anyone that you knew came down with symptoms. Um, and so you had a whole bunch of absences for that. There was also a lack of childcare because um, childcare was closed, schools were closed. Um, so you have people not showing up for, for work now. Um, and you know, even worse, if people avoided um, the quarantine requirements, they would show up and then affect everyone. And then um, you shut down for even longer than you probably would have. So huge issues in, in domestic supply. Uh, we can't reply, rely on foreign orders. So in Europe and Asia, you know, there were similar type restrictions. I think kind of a common playbook globally uh, for trying to contain this. Uh, we can't rely on what foreign governments did, um, but a lot of raw materials and subcomponents do come in from overseas that had an effect. Um, but if you remember, there were all the newsreels of the ships that were anchored off the coast in the in the ports. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, you know, at certain periods of time, everything got released at once from, let's say, Asia and came over to Los Angeles and in Long Beach. Um, and so volume increased. Um, but what was more drastic is the loss of efficiencies because social distancing took away all teaming aspects of jobs at ports. So and when you think of unloading a ship, it's not you know a one person operation, it's several people working together, sometimes closely. But then um, just as important, once you get items off the ship, you've only got so many places to put it, you've got to get it on trucks to get it out of the port. Well, DMVs were shut down, trade schools were shut down. Um, so it exasperated the truck driver shortage. You couldn't get drivers um, trained uh, and, and licensed. Um, and so things stacked up. Um, at one time at LA, um, I think at the peak, volume um, increased by 17% coming in, but the time to unload a ship increased by 300%. Um, and so that's, that's where we are today. And it's not, okay, well, these orders are, are lifted, so there's no longer an effect. We, we dug ourselves a hole. If we were operating at 80% of capacity um, for, let's say, six months, we need to then operate at 120% of capacity to dig out of that hole, you know, demand and everything else constant. Um, and we just haven't been able to, to get to that increased capacity to dig out of um, the hole that, you know, these, these orders have, have caused. Um, and it's, it's, signif it's significant um, in the auto industry um, and especially in the, in the collision area. When we talk about increased cycle time, so that's, that's a metric, it's a number that jumps off the, the page, but it had, it had real effects to, to shop owners. If it takes 20% longer to repair a car, well, that means it takes 20% longer to get paid because you get paid after the repair is complete. But not only does it take longer to, to get paid, you've got money invested for some parts that you can get, um, and so you have more money um, going out, um, taking longer for it to, to come in. Um, so big, big cash flow issues. But then also every shop is, is different, but you generally have only 
so much space to store cars. You know, you're relying on cars going in and out. Well, if they're if they're sitting there, um, you run out of room to to put your cars. Um, one of my clients I visited his shop, and you know, they have an area that's locked up that they store their cars for you know their their clients' protection. Mm-hmm. And they had them in rows three to four deep um, because they ran out of room to, to, to put them. Um, and which then meant um, if they had to get a car out in the back, I mean, think of that game of Tetris. You got to play to get, get the car out of there, which then, you know, is further time, um, you know, further expense in and, and, and doing so. Yeah. Um, so I think your original question was, you know, what do you need to, to do to protect yourself, um, you know, for this? So, you know, I went through, you know, a very long uh, monologue there of uh, what was going on, but that's the story you need to tell. And essentially that's, that's what we are. We need to demonstrate to the IRS that, this was a real issue. It's not that we just showed up to work to wear masks. We literally changed many aspects of our business. And it's very measurable in a way that's not readily apparent in top line revenue, but we had to change um, how we were operating. And that needs to be documented and come through. Right, so let's ask the question, Ray, uh, how can a business prepare itself for an IRS audit of their ERC claim. Yeah, so it's it's having this information readily available. And so f- f- first of all, when we say IRS audit, that has a connotation that it's 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 a terrible thing and I don't think anyone ever looks forward to that, but it's it's not a bad thing if you're prepared. If you've done everything right, then it's kind of a check the box exercise. And so the procedure will generally start um, with an IDR, um, which is information document request. Um, and you only have 30 to 45 days to respond to it. And so if you don't have your ducks, um, and I think you have 30 days, you could sometimes get a 15 day extension, um, but it could be difficult to get an extension beyond that. And so where I'm going with that is if you don't have your ducks in a row, you may not be able to furnish all the information in a, in a timely period. And so that starts with what I'm, what I'm saying. So first you want to have all the information and documents that will make it clear and plain as day that you're eligible for this in the first place. Then you want to have the documents in support of the calculations of the credit amount readily available. Because the, the, the way this works, and I did uh, skip over this previously, is my role in this is I determine um, the time period that uh, a client is, is eligible for this. Um, and then we work with other firms. Um, Omega Accounting um, is, is one of them, a trusted partner of ours, um, omegataxcredits.com uh, is their website. But they calculate the credit amount based on the time period that we determine is eligible. And that calculation is based off of um, employee wages. And so that's the other piece of documentation that you're gonna wanna have readily available of, okay, I claimed a credit for 500,000. That's based on having a partial suspension from March, 2020 through September, 2021. That would be the maximum period you could claim. And then Omega looks at what did you pay your employees over that period of time? And then they work the formulas of, well, what's the credit amount? Um, and so you'll want to make sure you know how it was calculated and having the, the payroll support behind that. Well, Ray, I mean, thanks for being on today. This is great information. I think our collision audience is going to get a lot from. Great. I'm happy, happy to be here and I'm happy to help. Thank you. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Body Shop Business, the podcast. Check out BodyShopBusiness.com for more podcasts.